Hello, everyone. Welcome to another new installment of Club Moffat Talks here officially with our new lineup of not Ryan and now Allison. My name is Chris. I'll be your host. I'm an instructional librarian. I always forget that I need to tell that part. And I'm Joseph, and I'm also an instruction librarian. I'm Allison. I'm the marketing and outreach coordinator here at Moffat Library. And joining us today is Danny Bills. You want to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little about what you do? Sure. Uh, I'm Danny Bills. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the Wichita Falls Museum of Art here at Midwestern State University. Um, we uh, Museum's been around since uh, 1967, but merged with MSU in 2005. So I've, I've been here through that and some other things. And and uh, it's primarily a, we we used to be an encyclopedic museum, but we morphed into just an art museum specifically for the last uh, 19 years or so. And and the, um, the collection is primarily focused on works of art on paper, which tend to be a lot of printmaking, which is what my undergrad degree is in from MSU. Matter of fact, uh, today's the 30th anniversary of my senior exhibition uh, oh. exactly <laughs> with the wow. congratulations and, that's and a, then that's after a, well that's a worked out kind of strange surprising uh anniversary that we got on yeah that's awesome. yeah and then uh then i got a mfa from wichita state university in wichita kansas also in printmaking so my path to working in the museum field wasn't art history based as much as it was uh based on that specific medium and and how this museum collected so much work in that area. Hmm. Are you are you seeing a lot of uh, uh, digital preservation as part of your job right now, or is it still trying to strictly be physical? Well, um, do you mean by digital artwork, or do you mean so what you have? What you have physically? Do you see a lot of um, movements in just preserving that, like uploading them digitally or making copies of the like? Yeah, so we've we've had a digital database for a while, and um, so we we do take the higher resolution photographs for that and keep those on on file with everything. We also just launched not that long ago, I think it was August, the uh, digital database that we have on our website. So now you can you you get most of what's in the database as far as name, title, medium, and and you know all that good stuff. So you can find that on our our collections tab in the um on the website and and it's meant to be a, a research option so ideally you you see something on there you like and then you contact us if you want to see it in person we arrange a, a meeting and a time to come and see that if it's not currently on display so it's, it's you know research opportunities chance to see artwork in person and it's very interesting so yeah the digital is is important in that sense i wonder if that's um available through our database list at the library i feel like that's something if it's not then it definitely should be just so we could also post it somewhere else so people can have access to it i'll okay. look at that after we're done recording i think yeah because if right now i just i just know about it set up through the webmaster on um hmm. on our our uh, website mm -hmm. i think that would be very important for us to have yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll get visitors who drive in from, I've had people drive in from, you know, as far as San Antonio to look at a mm. specific piece of art and, and get real excited about what we have in our collection. Because what we have is, um, it we have some well-known like names that would jump off of the pages of art history books because by focusing on printmaking, especially in the 60s and 70s, the printmaking had a resurgence in the 60s. Um, if you've got any art history background or or you know much about post-world war ii you know abstract expressionism was was going very strong and that was the idea of you know jackson pollock and no images and that sort of thing which printmaking has suffered through that but then when you get into uh pop art coming back and things being important and being mass produced and things like that printmaking really really took off again and and so in the 1974 around about, we got a matching grant from the National Endowment for the Arts because back then they could help you purchase art. Mm -hmm. And so every dollar we raised, they matched a dollar and we collected very important pieces. You know, um, um, your Andy Warhol, Lichtenstein, Rauschenberg. Uh, we have a Jackson Pollock screen print. We have a print by uh, Lee Krasner, 
Luis Nevelson is there's some really big names in there and it and it started back then and and we've continued to develop that. We have a a collection mechanism now that helps keep you know donors outside can participate in helping what's what's purchased by the museum and put into the museum. And so we've we've turned that into about a 1700 piece collection. And then we also have a ton of historical photography too that you'll find in that in that database, including a set of photographs by um uh, a local man named C.A. Fuse, whose uh, son was a carpenter at uh, MSU at one point, and he was Charles Fuse, and then his grandson Charles Fuse is who I, I I was talking to. But there's over 770 glass plate negatives. The physical glass plate negatives are here, and those were made prior to 1922. And those are all contact printed. They're all in the database, and we've got over 60 ish or so of those that are enlarged and, and are exhibition quality. We've curated a couple of exhibits from that. Wow, that is, wow. That is fantastic. Yeah, and yeah. they're fascinating too, because you see things in those photographs that you don't really understand. So you have you have historians doing research, trying to tell you, and one of the things I, I realized by various historians, one of the historians was uh, Michael Collins, who, uh, Dr. Collins, who I think had done a lot of work with you guys, and so they would come and speak about these things. And I would learn stuff like what different kinds of machines or something like that were in there. I also learned that that um, something that the Fuse, Fuse did is he shot a lot of photographs of, of people that weren't necessarily paying to have the photograph done. So there's a large number of people of color um, disproportionate to what a normal photographer would have done at that time because they would have been taking photographs to get paid. So we've got shots mm -hmm. of East Side. We got shots of the Sputters Negro baseball team. We've got um, a lot of uh, different types of farmers and workers and things like that. And then one other thing that I found out from the the grandson was that um, I kept seeing this car, like these Model A, Model. I'm not a car person, so I don't know like Model A, Model T, what that's all about. I know they all looked alike, right? Because there's a few shots of downtown. There's like tons of them down there. Well, what one of the incentives for taking a photograph was this guy had a car and he'd let you be in the photograph with his car. So this car I kept seeing that I thought was just the car at the time was actually the same car over and over <laughs> again in all the photographs. Because yeah. I guess that was a pretty cool thing if you didn't own a car to be in a photograph of the car. So um at that part was unusual too but i got lots of stories like that so if i'm going on too long tell me i'll i'll <laughs> oh no that's that's why it's so important to preserve like art yeah uh, uh -huh. literally just art but yeah any kind of uh physical media like that it's it's just imperative yeah. that we keep that stuff alive yep so yeah so the collection has been real important um one of the exhibits we did was just um, after COVID and we were coming back from that, we did um, we did a, a re-contextualizing, so to speak, of how artists looked, looked at. So what we did was um, we have lots of images where maybe there's a, a, an artist has made an illustration of the interior of a house with no one in it or maybe one person in it or there's this other stuff. So in the past, you would have like one certain kind of read on that, but then after shelter in place, you have a different kind of read on that. And we did a uh, a, a whole exhibition on a, called Dwelling, the Experience of Shelter, and we did that. And I think you can find that in the past ex past exhibitions tab on the website also. We also oh, so did, that's uh, still available then? Well, in online, you can kind of see what we did, but the exhibit's been taken down. But um then we did another one just simply based on color where um, we used, Todd Giles worked with us to be a liaison with the faculty. And I think it was 22, 23, mostly faculty, maybe one or two staff members wrote a small piece about what color meant in their area or in their field. And we put that up in the gallery too. So there's, there's all those writings in there about, you know, color and as it works with lighting in the theater department, color as it works mm -hmm. with advertising, et cetera, et cetera. So um, and lots of faculty people came in and took a little selfie with their with their writing <laughs> next to the piece of art it was close to. Well, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, Dr. Giles is also going to be doing some some stuff, a little exhibit with our special collections upstairs. So that's uh, something we're very excited about as well. Yeah, one of our current two of our current exhibits have something from him in it. Uh, one has one writing, and the other was basically curated by him, which is the Wilderness Passing exhibit. And that's up through the rest of the year. Nice. All right.
so this is the point where um well actually that is a lot of what we would probably be talking about anyway but um <laughs> yeah just just as a, a quick roundup here um let's talk about what we've been doing recently uh, just just for fun just some stuff that we've been going that we've been doing recently uh who wants to start I, okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, I, I liked your question when you sent that to me, because when I was in graduate school, I had a professor who, uh, he was actually a ceramics professor. I was taking some, uh, you know, optional classes from, and he said that one of the things he did with his students when it came to finding a subject matter for art is he made them talk about anything but art. So it became like, what do you do that isn't art? And and how do you make art by not looking at other artists? So it felt good to have, because, you know, you felt all that pressure just to stay within your field and focus on it and everything, but mm -hmm. it felt good to have outside interests. So I jotted down mine. Um, the newest thing that I've been doing, and it's it's uh, listening to these uh, YouTube videos when I go to sleep that are these readings of these books, long books like Lord of the Rings, but they put rain in the background. So it's supposed to make you fall asleep. Oh. And uh, that's the great part. The downside is uh, I don't know what point I fell asleep at. So every <laughs> night I, go, I can't find that point. Yeah. So <laughs> since I've read the books, it doesn't really matter. I'll just back it up to where I think it was about approximately close and I guess I guess if you're repeating information that'll make you fall asleep that much faster too so it's 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 an it's just a new thing for the last week or so um I've uh I've uh looking forward to the Netflix put Brooklyn 999 on and our 99 on and I, I've enjoyed it but I didn't realize there were eight seasons I only put four on there so I'm now I, I need the other four seasons so I'm I'm waiting on that and I do enjoy the documentaries. I'm waiting for another season of Ozark to come out, hopefully. And um, also recently watched the uh, uh, Resident Alien, I think was a mm -hmm. sci-fi series that's, that I really enjoyed. And then totally separate and apart from that, a couple of years ago, I got into blacksmithing and, and trying to do some knife making. And so um, I'm working my way towards the chef knives. I think everybody probably could use a kitchen knife of some kind. So um, and they're the hardest ones to make because they got to be real thin and they got to just work perfectly. You can't you got to have a plan and stick to it. So when I get time, that's what I've been working on. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, yeah. a lot of work, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good creative outlet because with like like I don't really make art anymore. I spend so much time around it day in, day out. And, and I feel like. You know, if I make a piece, it needs I need to have a reason for making. Like, what am I trying to say? What am I trying to do? So, just making a utilitarian object that can be used by everyone is it, it lets me focus on on the the creative physical part of it and not and just take a break from some of the more heady parts of it. Yeah, and that can be art too, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I, I totally get that though because I always tell people like I, I'll see someone saying uh, I want to work in a library because I like books. And I'll tell them the last place you ever want to work, if you even remotely enjoy being around books, is in a library. <laughs> I don't remember the last time I fully read a book, honestly, outside of first that. class. But I've had people walk in and and tell me, "Oh, you need such and such artist in the collection." And I'll say, "We have we have a piece by that artist," and they'll say, "It's not a good one." <laughs> and I was like, okay, so um, you think that I have that kind of time to go out and and invest all that time and energy and find somehow some way to to invest in the one artist out of the thousands that we have in there? And right, so, yeah. So, uh, and I don't, you know, I used to have so many of the pieces memorized, but now I, I just got to refer to <laughs> a list or something because it just blurs together. So I totally get like if you were surrounded by books. Like I'm surrounded by art that that would just not be you got other stuff you have to take care of exactly that's when you should bring out the age-old saying you get what you get and you don't throw a fit <laughs> exactly so be be grateful that we have this one piece and don't worry about the other stuff just be grateful that we have this one for you to look at and it takes effort too it, it takes a lot of work to, to get that stuff together anyway like yes yeah. It's not just so simple as get this one piece of art by this artist. Like, okay, well, we got to, you know, we, we have to work around to get to that point. Mm -hmm. It's like, you don't even know what it took to get this one, this thing we already have. 
Right. So right. don't start asking us about what's next yet until uh -huh. everyone's uh -huh. had a chance to look at what we already have. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes, we'll worry about what's next. You you just worry about what's in front of you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I have for what I've been doing. Um, I said on the last podcast, I had a goal of trying to read more this year and um, to update all the people who I know have just been waiting to hear how it's going um it's not going well have not i'm still on my second book um i don't like the it's an audiobook and i don't like the narration so it's taking me a while to get through it so i think the next progress for me is to do a nice little graphic novel in between there to keep my goal where it's supposed to be until i can read a full book I also this weekend watched for the very first time. I can't believe I've never seen it, but I just never have is um Kill Bill. Mm. So I watched that for the very first time this weekend. And that was honestly, I understand now why people talk about it so much because it was very cool and not at all what I was expecting. And I was also really surprised, like pleasantly surprised by the animation mm. in the middle of it. I wasn't yeah. expecting there to be animation. And I was like, wow, I was blown away by that. So here's the question then, volume one or volume two? I okay. I only watched the first one. Uh, okay. It's I didn't have time. It's it's yeah. Not, I didn't. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. it was yeah. I didn't have time to watch the second one because I was just doing it in the meantime while waiting for something else. But I do want to watch the second one like probably this week so that it's like still fresh in my mind from the first one. I did read though when I was logging the movie on Letterbox. I read that it was supposed to be one long movie, but mm -hmm. because it was had such a long runtime, they made him split it into two. So yeah. right now, I guess volume one then is my favorite since it's the only one that That's I've true. seen. Well, but, um, so I'd like to know when you finished all of them, if you figured out what uh, Tarantino's obsessed with. <laughs> I've heard the rumors. He's not beating the allegations. Not after, not after <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah I've heard, well, I've heard, and I've seen some of the screenshots from his movies before. Well, I mean, it's the first conversation in Pulp Fiction. It's oh, literally it really? the first thing they talk about in that movie. Yeah, I actually, I've never seen a movie by him until when I watched Kill Bill because I oh. was looking at the. Yeah, I was looking at the other stuff he's done and I was curious because I was like, have I seen anything by him? And I realized that I haven't. Obviously, I've heard of a lot of them, you know, Pulp Fiction, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, Inglorious Bastards, but I just haven't seen any of them. I'm kind of, I don't, I kind of get behind on like, or I haven't seen a lot of like the classics or like the big movies that people talk about a lot in pop culture. So that's part of my goal this year too, is watch more movies and I'm trying to watch like different stuff like not just new releases and things like going back and watching things that I haven't seen because the last time that I watched stuff kind of outside of my comfort zone was when I did film appreciation in college and I feel like that really did open my eyes to seeing a lot of different things so I'm kind of trying to do that now on my own time trying to watch and with reading too I'm trying to like branch out a little bit and read stuff too that I wouldn't usually watch as for tv I just started Yellowstone and that's what I'm watching now, TV wise. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, there was something you said that I wanted to piggyback off of, but um, this has been Sorry. happening with me a lot lately, but um, I just can't remember anything anymore. I can't keep a train of thought. Um, my my youngest is finally sleeping through the night, so I got six hours of sleep, maybe less. So sleeping is what you've been doing. Finally, yeah, I've been trying, trying to. to. Yeah, uh, yeah, trying. Yeah, but um, yeah, I I also don't have a lot to say. Also, is why I was going to jump in front of Joe. I usually go last, but um, did I say last time that I watched um, uh, the new True Detective? Yes. Yeah. Complaining about it. Yeah. Yeah. You said you didn't like it and you didn't finish it. I don't think. Well, that is one. No, I finished it. That's one thing oh, okay. that I did want to say is that um, I think True Detective once again broke my FOMO. Um, I had a friend who was bothering me about it, and I'm never listening to him 
in week one tell me to watch something again because that was a horrible waste of time. Well, I think Twitter is in agreement with you because I saw a bunch of people on Twitter talking about how terrible it was. And like, didn't want the one of the creators or something put out a tweet too that was basically like, stop judging us. You don't know how hard it is. Uh, I I imagine it must be hard because they've had four seasons of a show and one of them's been good. So, yeah, yeah I imagine. Um, That's a lot of shows these days. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you haven't watched uh, any other Tarantino, my favorite is Reservoir Dogs. Oh, the yeah. The world's favorite is Pulp Fiction. But, uh, yeah, all the all of his movies are good. Like, he doesn't make a bad movie. I haven't seen Death Proof. That's the only one. He's he's like David Lynch to me, though. He's a, he's a director who just, he never makes a bad movie, but he only makes movies when he, like, when the, the urge hits him. So, long career that he's had. He's only had, like, what, eight movies, and he's working on his last ninth one right now or no i think he's, he's aiming for 10 he wants he's, to do yeah. like 10 his whole career and retire but he yeah. also did an interview where he was like he kept talking about how hard it was for him because he had more ideas and then people were like well don't do more than 10 then don't why are you putting a limit on yourself no one told you that you have to only do 10 he made that limit for himself yeah i think that's just what it is he wanted to get all he wanted to get all of his creative outlet out in, in 10 films but uh <laughs> Then he do the Hateful Eight also. Yep, and that's uh, what that's what reminded me. I was like, wait, a, wait a second. Hateful Eight was his eighth movie, so um, mm -hmm. and that's yeah, also but, why Kill Bill is considered one long movie because that's his like fifth or sixth movie. Oh, like, okay. Um, and then was it what do you call the one with uh, was it Jackie Brown or something? like Jackie that? Jackie Brown was uh that's his third. Okay. Thing. I don't love that one, but I need to watch it again. I think I was just in a bad mood the first time I watched it because <laughs> I it just it went completely past me and i was like yeah whatever it's people talking in rooms about how they're going to screw each other over yeah and that's that's the whole movie but it's <laughs> it's it's really well acted and it, otherwise it's it's really good but yeah i don't know but yeah if um if you haven't i'd say just start from the first from his first one start with reservoir dogs and, and go up because they're all okay. they're all fantastic okay um <laughs> i personal opinion just just me i think tarantino's overrated um, here we go that's becoming I, the I, more popular opinion these days oh my gosh Chris just <laughs> left just, <laughs> he's out okay oh my gosh um i his 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 I'm films <laughs> his his films have a lot of sameness to me and like a little bit like uh, M. Night Shyamalan, where it's like, oh, it's going to have a twist ending. Okay, great. It's going to have a twist ending. All of your movies have a twist ending. All of them. So we know it's coming. Uh, then there's, it's not a twist anymore. We know that this thing is going to happen. And I feel like the Tarantino has things like that, that he does, that he like does in every movie. And you're just like, See, you 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 need yeah, to do something new, dude. Yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah. I could do it. No, I mean you've got, yeah. I mean you've got um, you do have good in twist endings also with Tarantino. So it's not just that he has his his standard tropes. Yeah, you also have uh some things that he likes to come back to and things that you see a lot. Like um, I mean that that's just the I think just having an authorial voice is that you're gonna have stuff that just keeps kind of coming back up and. It's almost like a thesis for his career, I think. That's why I mentioned David Lynch with him in particular is because David Lynch, I mean, the tagline for uh, Inland Empire is a woman in trouble. And that's like 90% of his catalog is a woman in trouble. It's just, yeah. yeah, it. I don't know, I respect that. I admire someone who can have similar movies with similar themes and still make a really good career out of like just people admiring their work for what it is well you know you bring up david lynch i think what was it blue velvet that he did that yeah. professor that i mentioned earlier hated that movie so much he said that if anybody liked that movie he couldn't be friends with them you, you, todd giles said that no 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 that professor oh. i mentioned in grad school that oh, I okay had, that, that <laughs> I, talked about the, I was about to the, say Ooh, no i don't i'm not speaking for bit. todd uh but no, he he hated that movie so much. 
And and that's always stuck in my head because I, I don't even know if I made it all the way through the movie. I just know that that some people really like it and, and that I've met a couple of people that just really hate it. I I went to a friend's house, but this friend of mine was getting into David Lynch stuff because he liked Twin Peaks. Um, he wanted to watch Blue Velvet with my wife and I and his wife and I. Um, did that happen again? Yes. Yeah. Ah, this oh. computer, I swear. Um, that was an accident, actually. Um, but yeah, so that was also the day that we got our um, genetic testing back for our first daughter. Because, you know, they just, they give you the whole rundown of like, here's, you know, make sure everything's mm -hmm. okay and everything's growing okay. And um, my friend's wife hated Blue Velvet so much that she didn't say a word to us the whole time. Uh, she despised that movie. Then we got our genetic test back about halfway through it. And um, we were, we were um, hanging out, drinking beer or whatever. And I opened a new one and drained it completely because I was so relieved hearing that everything was okay. Um, so that's what I'll remember for, from Blue Velvet Forever. <laughs> I think I like that movie a lot, but that's the one that's going to always stick with me is I'm going to be thinking about that moment. A divisive movie can be fun, though, sometimes, like especially with a group of people to watch a movie that it's like some people in the room are absolutely hating it and some people are loving it. It makes for fun conversation, especially mm -hmm. after the movie. That's what I love too about going to the movies with friends. Like after you get out and someone's like, wow, that was so good. And you turn around and your other friend's like, I, that sucked. I hated it. And then you can all like discuss and debate on the drive home what was good and what wasn't. So my, my most vivid memory is being seven years old with my cousin and his mom and my mom and seeing the star Wars in the theater the oh, first yeah. when they came out yeah. and it was, it was here in town. It's, it's where that Carmack is out there in Parker square, but it was the previous theater, the one they tore down. So it's like, mm -hmm. um, if you ever go out to the Goodwill on Southwest Parkway or any of the older grocery stores that have the, the, the rocks for the walls on the outside, that's what that mm -hmm. theater had. And I can remember standing in line against those rocks, waiting for the whole thing to start. And, the whole evening just got burned into my brain from where we ate dinner to everything else based on how much that movie blew away my seven-year-old mind. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. That was me with E.T. We took a field trip when we were like in kindergarten or first grade. And I think E.T. had already been out before that, but it was like re-showing in the theater or something. And we took a field trip. I actually don't even know if it was school. It might have been like, you know how sometimes you do those like it's like before school like thing where you put kids and so, kind of like a daycare, but not fully. Anyways, I remember because we went to go see E.T. and my little kid brain was blown away by that movie. I felt every emotion you could ever feel at like six years old. Well, that's a good one, too. Um, um, was I? Uh, oh, I was going to say that I watched The Queen's Gambit. And it was good. That's it. OK. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was a good show. Yeah, um, I have been deliberately doing uh, more more reading. Um, I'm currently reading a, like an anthology collection of short stories called The Essential Border Town. Not a new book, uh, but it's about a resurgence of um, the Fae and they connect to a modern American town and the chaos that ensues. Um, then Athena and I are reading together at night. Uh, we're doing the first book in the Wheel of Time series, uh, Eye, of the, uh, Eye of the World. And uh, we're just doing a chapter a night, every night. Um, oh, that's nice. And uh, that, that's that been a lot of fun. Um, and also, and this is a thing that I've been trying to do, is um, every month, uh, the library gets a new set of books from the Junior Library Guild that goes into our uh, what we call our curriculum materials library. It's our youth literature section. Uh, and to sort of highlight that, uh, each month I try to read one of those new books from the Junior Library Guild. So uh, this month, we've already gotten our new selection. And I did this storybook called See Otto Say Hi. And it's this little robot trying desperately to make friends with a bird that he sees outside. Uh, no. And it's it's just adorable. I really loved it. 
I need to check that out. My my daughter started to see. I was playing a video game with robots, and she's latched onto me saying the word robot. So yeah, everything's a robot to her now. So I, I need to check that out. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, shit. Um, I we did also watch the uh, first couple of seasons of uh, the Resident Alien show, and uh, I had mentioned before that I had started watching the uh, Fargo series mm. uh, and I, I, when i first talked about it i think i'd only watched the first season and i was like just starting the second season now i'm in the fifth season which is the the last one the most recent one um and i have enjoyed most of those there was one whole season that i did not care for uh but the rest of it i've really enjoyed and they have been all connected they've had a point of connection the uh the first season was connected to the original fargo movie and then there has been some kind of connection between the seasons uh even though each individual season is its own story arc uh often with completely different characters though there will be a little bit of overlap some kind of connection between them um and and that's been been fun to watch but um i think that's pretty much what's going on with me yeah so I, I have a friend who's been, uh, I, I don't want to say bothering me to watch Resident Alien uh, because of present company, but um, <laughs> he's been mentioning it for years now, and now it's on Netflix, and I, I don't have any excuse to not watch it, I guess. My my only disappointment is it's only two seasons. <laughs> so it's over, like it, they canceled it, right? I don't know. Oh, okay. I, I don't think that it's been canceled i think okay. it's still ongoing i know that it's based on a comic book series and i think the comic book series is still ongoing okay uh, i don't know that for a fact okay, well, i'll have to jot that one down and force myself to finally watch it i guess <clears throat> all right so danny we kind of already talked a little bit about i mean a little bit we talked to quite a bit about um what your department kind of does uh, your uh, institution kind of does but um i know you had a few more things that you wanted to talk about today you wanted to did you want to get into those by chance sure sure i can go over the current exhibitions and, and what's coming up if you'd like sure um so basically we have um we consider it five gallery spaces but two of the spaces are sort of connected so we tend to have a larger exhibit in that space and in that space, we just opened an exhibit by a gentleman named Carson Crichton. And he's he's out of uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So he's a uh, he teaches there um, in the art department at the University of New Mexico, and also a thing called Tamarin Institute, which is a printmaking uh, facility. So he's he's got this large uh, printmaking background, but he makes these these paintings that are collages. So he'll he'll do something like a like a woodcut relief top print, then he'll cut that up and glue it into the painting. And there would be, you know, it's sort of a mixed media thing. So there's some large canvases there. So it's a, it's different than what you would see in a lot of our collections, even though we have three of his his pieces in our collection too. And one of those pieces is up in another another exhibit we have that I'll tell you about in a minute. But yeah, so there's about 25 works in this uh solo exhibition of his that that are in our what we call kind of our main gallery space and it runs through September but he'll be here April the 4th for um a reception actually he'll be here all week um, but he'll be in the art department doing workshops with the students there and over in Fane so um and, and he may produce a piece that he donates I'm not sure yet it'll depend on how the workshop goes but real interesting uh gentlemen and uh i think that people will really enjoy getting to meet with him and talk with him so um and there's lots of information out there on him uh so his name's karsten Crichton. the exhibit's called fragments and selected scraps the works of karsten Crichton. so he has a big we have his artist statement in there and he refers to the recycling of these things from one piece of artwork into the next piece of artwork and we've got a, a an interactive in there where he sent us um some of the scraps and pieces that aren't currently in a piece of artwork. And we set it down on a, on a pedestal with a little empty picture frame. So you can make a collage, lay that frame down, and then take a picture with your cell phone. So you can make a, your own little collage of, of his parts and pieces. And if you choose to post it, we've got the hashtags and things that you can post it to, to tag the museum. And, and oh, that's got, so cool. 
Yeah, and, and we've done that once before with a different collage artist, and it was very successful. So, um, and we have also have, uh, he sent some of the woodcut plates, and we have those where you can touch the plates and feel the texture of the plates. So and, and there's a little bit of instruction there on how a relief print gets made, you know, it's basically a stamp. So, but that people sort of need that. If you're not, if you've never made prints, it seems kind of alien. Hey, there you go. And uh, so um, it helps to kind of see that. So it's, 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 I think it's something there for everybody, you know, from wherever you're from to kind of understand how, because you can see the plate and you can see how it's reversed in the piece, you know, so it could even be, you could make the stretch to like letter block printing or something like that. If you, if you wanted to, you know, how books get used to get made and that kind of thing. So that's, I think it's, it's a really good exhibition. And the one I mentioned earlier when I was mentioning Todd Giles, he, um, he's curated a few, we've co-curated and had him curate a few exhibitions over the years. Uh, quick story about, uh, Todd came here in 2012. I don't know if he's told you this story or not, but I'll tell it all the same. Um, he uh, he's always, I uh, guess, taught his his English courses with some reference to art and pop culture and things like that. So the semester he arrived, we had a, a, a highlights of the collection show up in those two big spaces I was talking about. And he came in and, and saw it and and it changed his whole lesson plan because he was going to put students on buses and go down to the Metroplex. He didn't know that that Wichita Falls had an art museum with these pop artists and post-World War II artists and, you know, things. And even this like wilderness passing exhibit that he co-curated, these, these, uh, these etchings were made between 1820 and 1825, you know, so, and we've got, we have the broadside of Paul Revere from 1770 in our collection. So we've got this, this large, um, and it's the hand colored, uh, thing that was in the in the papers and that sort of thing so but he uh he we started collaborating pretty much right away because he wanted to bring students over so he's been over for some few traveling exhibits and and we curated one where he uh called it poets painters and paper and so it was it was art from the collection a collection of his broadsides and it was an interdisciplinary uh, collaboration thing had a little happening thing with some jazz musicians in the corner and then we presented at a Texas Association Museum conference on that on that together on that back in 2018 but so this this current exhibit that's that opened in January it's up through December 21st it's Wilderness Passing the Hudson River Portfolio 1820 to 1825 so it refers to that Hudson River Valley there up around New York and the and the, how people were responding to that making art about it writing about it um, there were, he mentions authors that were writing about the effect of uh, industrialization on the environment back then, you know, 200 years ago. So it's kind of interesting from that perspective. Um, it didn't plan it, but there's a portable wall in there that that we put a really light. It doesn't even look green. It's so light green and almost looks yellow, but we put a coat of paint on it. We did the graphics. And when after I picked out the paint sample, I looked at the weird, you know, they have weird names. The name of that paint sample was climate change. I, I didn't, we didn't plan that, plan that or wow. anything, but um, yeah. So there's, there's, we do all of our vinyl graphics in house, so we've been able to really stretch uh, how that looks, you know. And so it's, it's a very, it's a lot, a lot of quotes and everything. It's a very good exhibit. He's bringing his classes to it. So yeah, there's twenty, there was twenty pieces of artwork in this portfolio, and we have all twenty in there. So it's, it's, it's a real interesting exhibit. And next door to that one, we have a smaller space. And, and that's what we call our gallery too. And we've got an exhibit. Todd has one thing in that exhibit on a pestle where he wrote about a piece from Courier and Ives, but the rest of the exhibit is uh, uh, curated by Candy Dean. So she's she's the, uh, let me give her title correct, uh, uh, assistant, uh, assistant Vice President for Student Affairs. So she's she's written, these are all, it's called Visual Voice, Who Controls Black Representation? So this this has to do with how black people get represented in art, anything from uh, a total lack of control to maybe somebody doing a self-portrait and they have full control over it. And so there's a lot of interesting commentary on on these pieces. They all have extended labels. It's it's very interesting exhibit. I think everyone can get, get something out of that. Um, uh, you'll see things a little differently than you did before, I think, when you come to that one. Um, and there is an interactive exhibit in that too, where you can draw a little picture on a little piece of paper and 
pin it up to a board that is now completely covered with these little, I mean, there's two 32 by 40 panels and they're totally covered. You can't even see the panels anymore. They're starting to layer up. It looks like, um, like feathers made out of little square pieces of paper almost. And, uh, and we're about to open one in the next few weeks on the, um, and this is part of our permanent collection also, the Frank Golke, who was a photographer from here, photographed uh, the aftermath of the 1979 tornado. And what he did was he came, he got a call he from his mom. He was living in Colorado at the time. This would have been April 10th or 11th, 1979. And, and he answered the phone and she said, well, just let you know, everybody's okay. He's like, what are you talking about? Because, you know, well, there's no internet. We don't know the minute that something happens. And she told him what happened. So he drove down and he went to a lot of locations and took a photograph. And I don't know how he got back to that exact spot back, but he came back a year later and took a photograph again. So you see the building built back or not built back. And, and, and it's tricky because a lot of people, when you see two photographs, you think before and after. It's not before and after. It's after and a year after. So, um, and, I, and, and I don't joke about it, but I've, I've told a few people, wouldn't you be kind of mad if it was before and after? And that guy was standing outside your house and it's like, hey, what are you doing out here? <laughs> oh, nothing. I'll see you tomorrow. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, it's it's after and after. So, but there's, there's, uh, they're, so they're presented in diptychs, one above another, and there's, I think 20 of those, yeah, 20 of those. And so what we're doing a little bit different with it this year, and you you can see this, you can see those images on our website too, under a, a former uh, a past exhibit, but we've included a, an interactive that's going to be a six foot long, four foot or so wide map of the path that the tornado took with the names of the streets and a little red number for each photograph. And we're going to have these little red, map pins you know the little round ball on the little red map pin so if you choose to put a pin in the wall where you were if you were here then you can do that so um it's it's the community will you know always appreciate that they come in every year looking for these things so so and and usually the news will come out and do something on that so we, we made it a little more interactive this time so the whole gallery kind of kind of works that way and that one It's supposed to open, I believe, the 23rd. I think I may have put May 23rd on the piece of paper, but I think it's March 23rd. Mm. But um, yeah, because April 10th is the anniversary date on that. So, but Frank, uh, Frank ended up um, teaching at several universities. He's a well known photographer. He finished up in Arizona State. And I believe the MoMA also owns this collection of photographs. So, um, Museum of Modern Art in New York. So he, he's well collected. So it's it's just kind of a special thing to have have these. And and I was nine years old, so I I remember lots of things that I see in the photograph. There's this one photograph that has a real tiny tiny helicopter up in the sky, and I remember hearing those helicopters at night going over the city. I guess shining lights down to see what was going on, and, and you hear that thump 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 at night. And, so when I see that, uh, it brings back some memories. I think a lot of people go through that too when they look at them. Um, another exhibit we have coming up, this will be in the fall, is um, we've had, this will be the third time we've had this exhibit. It's called Birds and Art. And what it is, is um, it's it's very simple concept. Uh, every piece is going to have a bird or something to relate to a bird in it. But what it is, is there's a, a museum named the Lee Yockey Woodson Art Museum up in Wasau, Wisconsin. And Wasau may be a name you recognize. You may see it on paper towel dispensers and that sort of thing. It's a paper mill town. So that's that's where all that stuff comes. So I, I got to, a few years ago, I got to go and be a juror for this exhibit, one of the three that they flew in to do it. And they, this is their thing. They, they do this thing every year. It's rented out every year to several museums. They do this fantastic catalog because they're a paper town. So they take a lot of pride in doing their own. They have uh, paper money like we had oil money basically back in the day. So, um, but they'll, we looked at like a thousand slides over a three day time period and, and narrowed it down to what it was. And, and I remember I said, can I rent this exhibit? And they said, no, it's pre-rented. You'll have to get the next one. So I didn't, we didn't get the one that I juried. We got the one after that, but we're going to get that again. And it'll be about sometimes not all the work travels, but there's fantastic catalog. And that'll, that'll be here September 7th through December 7th. So um, 
but they, uh, they're a fantastic museum. They do a great thing. They had a, a really interesting exhibit when I visited there that they had borrowed from the Smithsonian. I think it may still tour, tour. It's called, it was called from medieval to metal, the history of guitar. So every display case, which is like a prefab case had one of these instruments or a replica instrument hanging in it. Everything from lutes and lyres, which I don't know a lot about to Van, you know, Eddie Van Halen's Frankenstrat and all that good stuff. And I remember coming around the corner and seeing this totally empty case. I was like, did they forget something? What's going on? I looked over at the label and it said air guitar. And I thought, that's absolutely brilliant. I'm so glad they did that. And and they had the, they even had the, that, that dissecant stuff in the corner of it. Like, like <laughs> as if something was in there, you know, and, yeah. and I did, I'll admit, I kind of looked at it from a few different angles just to make sure it was really empty. And I wasn't being pranked within a prank kind of thing. But yeah, so they they did a fantastic job, and 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 I think uh, I got two more I'll tell you about real quick. Um, we'll probably do another um, in January of the year twenty twenty five, January through December. Uh, we've tentatively scheduled another exhibit of the the fuse photography, and and the way that comes about back when we wanted to we got some grant money and we wanted to uh, what you call contact print all of those glass negatives that's just where you lay it directly down on a piece of photosensitive paper and shine light on it so you capture that that you don't get all the details you get from an exhibition and quality photograph because you got to dodge and burn and do other things to get that but uh the the person I found to do it lived in Austin actually her name's Iris, her name's Iris Davis so I would drive down about a third of those at a time. I didn't want to drive them all down at once, but after she did all the contact printing, then we selected about 30 for, you know, an exhibit. And she enlarged those up from 11 by 14 to 16 by 20. Well, this would be the second time we did that. And I don't know how we'll do it anymore because I think she kind of retired from that. Um, she did taxes also. So she was a photographer and accountant too. But but it, after 9-11, it got really hard to those chemicals that get used in that process were on um no no lists you know oh. for, for hazmats and stuff like that so you you could pay as much to get one as it would cost to get it so but it was real interesting because we got some panels for the exhibit where it shows how she had to enlarge these photographs well she didn't do this for us she'd already had it done but uh, her studio which was at her house the enlarger actually went up into the ceiling so there was like a, a an extended little thing so you could get far enough away to do these large format things that she was doing. So, um, but we've got, I don't know if they'll be on display, but we also got the fuse cameras. The family donated the, those bellow style cameras that you see in the movies and things. So, so, but I've got that tentatively scheduled. And then we've got uh, an artist in um, February of 25 in, in the, in the bigger space um, named Delita Martin. She uh, runs a place called Black box press studio so she's a printmaker that that runs her own own thing uh um uh, black american uh largest private printmaking and letterpress studio in texas so um you know checking her out on the uh, on her website is very interesting and that's my three pages of exhibitions right there <laughs> how long does it take to get this together like do, do you do you plan that i mean you, you already have some plan for almost an entire year from now does that is it just that whole time you're getting stuff ready and preparing for just how the exhibition is going to look and what's right gonna we, we try to be two years out actually so the way the way that two years out in booking uh not two years out in production so so what would happen is um like as you, we have these little internal schedules, like six weeks out, you do this, four weeks out, you do that. So, you know, nailing down graphics and things is usually a few weeks before. And then the art arrives, either we go pick it up or it arrives or whatever uh, within three weeks so we can install and things like that. So, yeah, um, there's a certain amount of, you know, because then you have your your marketing schedules too, where you have to release your press releases and get your posts ready and everything else. And then you got what you do during the course of the exhibit, if you have any educational programming or tours or special events that you have within that. Um, uh, good, great example would be back in 2018, I believe, um, we had a very generous donor, uh, the Metters. They, um, they sponsored the exhibit. I don't know if any of you saw it where Cheech Marin came to town and the comedian. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so he he's a 
big time Chicano art collector. Matter of fact, um, they have his museum now in Riverside, California, which his collection became a part of. So we were able to get him and and his works on paper portion of it. We were, I think we were the last place to get it before it became part of the museum. Not that they won't loan it out again, but we we were the last run on that. And of course, we had him during Hispanic Heritage Month. And he gave, uh, he was here for about two and a half days. He he did tours with the students. He did a book signing over here and he did a lecture uh, we ended up having it over in the Fane uh, Theater, and um, it's about 500 people. It was free, but we had reservation on the tickets because we didn't want anybody, you know, gabbing tickets and not showing up. But um, the front row of that, we reserved for the Cafe Con Leche program, which is uh, the, the mm -hmm. local Gonzalo Robles runs that. It's for um, high school they start mentoring people in the fifth grade, right? So in, when the time they get to high school, they're aiming them at college and they aim them for the local colleges. And so 29 seats in the front row were mostly Hispanic students learning what Chicano art meant. And and I won't get into all the details, but Gonzalo talked about the impact it had on them. Well, two years later, I co-curated an exhibit with four students. They, they were younger than the students that were there, but um, four students from that program helped me pick out four artists from the, the Houston Latino Artist Registry. And it, we ended up with um, Mexican-American, uh, Venezuelan-American, Guatemalan-American, Ecuadorian-American. We didn't plan it that way. It just sort of worked out that way. And so um, we had an entire program with with those artists coming in, those students learning about curation and working in a museum. And um, matter of fact, I just turned in a, a scholarship recommendation for one of the students the other day so i think they're about ready to start college but uh zavala uh cultural initiative the zavala dancers came out and and did dancing out in the courtyard on our pavilion as part of the program that day too so it was really using an exhibit to really connect with the community that way and and one exhibit feeding off into another exhibit and et cetera et cetera um, it was fantastic it sounds wow. difficult, but it sounds very rewarding. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, it was amazing because, you know, when you're working with, with students like that, they'll come up with things that you don't come up with. So if you if you look at the graphics for that show, it says finding your voice, Cafe Conlechi co-curates. Well, the word your is in two different colors. The Y is yellow and the O-U-R is blue. And the idea was it's our voice and your voice. It was a duality that that one of the, the students came up with. Uh, actually, her name's America. She came up with that. And um, uh, I wouldn't have come up with that. That, that you know, I, I, I come up with a title and people do whatever they do with graphics on it. I, I'm not usually uh, micromanaging the graphic part of it, but but that was essential that that worked that way. So it was really amazing. Yeah, I remember seeing stuff after that had happened, like that y'all had posted and I was kind of like, oh, because I didn't, I guess I just hadn't, I didn't know it was happening. And so when I saw the stuff after, I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, that's such a huge deal. And it looked like y'all had such great turnout. And now that you're saying 500 people came to like the lecture, like that's a, an amazing turnout, especially for this campus to get right. that many people invested and like wanting to come see a speaker like that. It's very, very cool. And like also the people it touched, the students it touched and what it led to with the students that ended up like getting to work more with you and learn more. Like it's just, it's a very cool thing to do. And all of these exhibitions seem very interesting. Like the one you said that's coming up about the tornado, mm -hmm. like that's a huge part of Wichita Falls history. People still talk about it all the time, especially people that were here during it. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a freshman, we went to visit channel six, like the news station as part of my mass communication stuff. And they were talking about the tornado and telling us about like how it was that day to like capture it and how it affected the news and all that. And so it's very cool. Well, the uh, the west side of the museum was actually damaged during that tornado and, and mm. the build back ended up being a renovation that added on an entire collections wing, including the vault, which is, you know, two foot thick concrete walls and all this stuff. So the museum itself actually came back stronger, you know, yeah. a, a individual donor paid for a lot of that. So, um, but yeah, there was, you know, what's going to happen to the art? What's, you know, all this stuff, you know? Yeah. So, well, yeah. and then now all these years later, after that happened, and now you're going to have an exhibition there showing yeah. the, like you said, the aftermath and then the after aftermath a year later. So 
and, and one photo from a very far distance does have uh, the Colosseum in it, and you can see oh. some stuff missing oh. off of the roof of it. So, yeah, I and I know that'll be so cool for the community too, like the Wichita Falls community. When we post stuff like about our special collections, things that we have, archives, all of that, it'll usually get a lot of interaction because the people in this community, they enjoy that. They like to look at that and especially art to do around something that was a huge event. Like I said, that some of them lived through, some people might have just heard about or, you know, even been so young during it, but it's very interesting. And then all the other exhibits you mentioned too, especially what's going on right now the ones y'all have happening at the moment there's something for everyone for sure and I think the interactive ones uh whenever I go to museums I love the interactive exhibits and it's also a great way to get people to engage like you said you have a hashtag for people to post online so it gets a really good way for people to engage with the museum be posting about it talking about it which ultimately helps y'all gain traction and continue to do what y'all are doing so well Sorry, I know I just talked a lot, but I also have a question. <laughs> sure. I was curious, I know, because you said you've been here for a while now and you've been with the museum for a minute. So I'm sure you've done so many, you know, exhibitions over the time. And like you said, there the Birds and Art one is a repeat one and there might have been others. But I was curious if you have a favorite or maybe a couple of favorite ones that y'all have done before that, you know, maybe stuck out to you or touched you personally. Yeah, so um, one that had a lot of impact on me was around like 1998 or 1999, something, or maybe maybe it was 2002. I, I had a little two-year period where I left and did some teaching and came back, so I, it might have mm -hmm. been when I came back, but it was a, a traveling exhibit. It wasn't one of ours, but it was called Moving the Fire, and it was put out by USA Exhibits, and what it did was it had a lot of black and white photography of, of Native Americans back at the time when they would have been relocated around the country and um, having grown up in Texas and knowing about all the tribal situations, in Oklahoma, I didn't realize how little I knew because mm -hmm. what that exhibit illustrated is it had a lot of graphics where it showed where a tribe started and where they ended up and, and why so many were in Oklahoma and, and the horrible things that happened and, and, um, and, and, so on and so forth. It just really, it put it into a perspective not to, not that history books aren't important, but you had this visual on on how this happened, you know, and and why you know a a, a tribe in the on the east coast and the north northwest of it was now in Oklahoma on dirt and rocks and 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 what kind of shock that must be, and then it went on into like like um, putting the children into into schools and cutting their hair and giving them English names and things like that and and what was happening. So that had a that had a tremendous amount of impact on me and, and that it opened my eyes to, to it in a way where I'd only kind of like, you know, I knew loose facts on it, but it, but it, it, it made a lot more sense to me. And that, and that Cafe Con Leche project moved me a lot too. Um, not just the way that they were able to, to, to do the, because one of the things I found out because Cheech talked about this in his lecture and I, and I had another artist in the collection named Paul Valadez who donated 200 collages to us. He, he teaches down in, for UT in the Rio Grande Valley area. Both these men talked about not learning Spanish when they were young because their parents didn't want them to. They didn't want them to have that accent and, and, and go out and try to, you know, go through life. And so Chief was talking about learning Spanish like in his 40s, you know, and, and that his, mm -hmm. his, his Russian wife speaks a lot of languages. And one of the languages she speaks better than him is Spanish, you know, but but um, he, he talked, he told stories about like, like his grandmother li lived with him that still remembered that Tucson was in Mexico and because he was asking her where they were from for a school project and she said Tucson Mexico and he goes you mean Tucson Arizona and she kind of snapped at him no it's it was Mexico you know mm -hmm. and stuff like that so you know you 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 get to you get to get some impact from something because that, then I found out that that you know the five students that worked from with me on that second part of that project the curating the show uh, one was from Nigeria, four are Hispanic, and two out of the four didn't speak Spanish. So it was it, when I asked them, because I needed to know how different artists were going to identify, whether it's Latin X or Hispanic or Chicano or whatever, 
they didn't know any more than I did about it. So I had to, so I asked each four artists, I got four different answers, you know, and that was, that was perfect. Cause that's how it works. That's how life works. And so yeah. it was, you know, they were learning things. I was learning things, but um, every, every once in a while, you know, I'd have to look at a long, I was trying to, I was updating a resume the other day. And I think it's, so I was here four years before the merger and then 19 years since and about eight to 10 exhibits a year. So it's like 180 plus exhibits. And so some stand out and some I go, oh, I totally forgot about all of that, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's been a there's been a few because like we did a, a collector circle exhibit where I was able to crunch some numbers and the collector circle is it's a long story. You can kind of read about it on the website, but it's community members donating money. I look at some artwork, I set it out there for them, and then they vote on what they want. So it's like I pre-vet the work, but I'm not the final decision maker. And so what we found out was we were able to double the works of people of color within the collection. And we were collecting female artists at a rate of 26%, which is 15% higher than the MoMA is collecting female artists. Now they might have bigger numbers because they're a bigger place, but as a percentage, we we were ahead of that. So trying to balance out that collection and and have representation for a lot of people in it has been very rewarding too. Yeah. So it's, it's exhibitions, it's collection, it's it's seeing the reactions people have. But but yeah, I could probably should have prepared a list. I probably should have saw that question coming <laughs> about <laughs> which ones, but. I don't know, maybe it's a little more honest just to go off the top of your head and see what what's impacted you. But yeah, there's there's been a lot. And uh, so. Yeah, well, I think that was a great answer. And I think it just shows like how important art is, you know, like just the impact it can have. And it's something that happened, you know, a while ago, something that you worked on a while ago, saw all that time ago, but to this day, it still meant something to you and you still remember it. And it also changed the way you think and it opened your mind to things you didn't know. And it's kind of like you said too, you know, it's not like we don't learn in history class. You know, we learn about these things. We might even see a couple pictures in the textbook or while we're doing research, but to see such visual art like that and on the walls and to be reading the stories right next to it as you're looking at this art and you see all the other people in the museum with you it's just like it's an experience that I feel like connects people not just to the art but also kind of like to community and just to people and humanity so I'm really happy that we have the museum here I've gone over a good amount of times especially when I was in college me and my friends would try and go to at least one exhibit a semester that we try and go to a couple more so I really think it's a great thing that we have it here. And I'm glad that it's, you know, because you said, I didn't know what you said at the beginning, how it wasn't always a part of MSU, that it only became a part of MSU in 2005. So I'm glad that it is because mm -hmm. I think it's probably one of the better parts of the university, in my opinion. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, real quick note. Um, so a funny thing kind of happened um, a few years ago, I was teaching I taught art appreciation for a long time, both off and on at MSU and then at, at North Central Texas College, too, which is down the road. And I was always trying to figure out a way to sort of explain printmaking because it gets so complicated. So I bought this uh, documentary, um, it was, you know, one hour long documentary and, I, and about and I watched it and I found four specific pieces from our collection mentioned in this documentary. Um, Warhol, the Paul Revere piece piece by Wenzel Homer and another piece by Edward Hopper. Very, very popular wow. piece by Edward Hopper. And then I found, if I, once I wrote down all the names of the artists, that we had like 30 of the artists, that not their specific pieces. But, so we curated an exhibit based on that one time and, and had the documentary to go with it. And you, mm -hmm. and the collection manager, she, she, Brianna Satterfield, she put labels up where if it would have the time index of where that piece was mentioned in the documentary. And so you you get you I don't know the overall impact of that, but if if somebody's putting out a documentary and and I mean it it's a sort of a validation of like a lot of good planning over the years to have your pieces and all your artists mentioned in that. And it gave and some of the things mentioned at the end of the documentary gave me uh targets to go for <laughs> that weren't in the collection. And so uh, one artist, uh, she was a graffiti artist, uh, Caledonia Curry's her name, but she went by the street name Swoon. But what she did was 
she would make large woodcuts of people from the neighborhood and then cut them out to the shape of the person. And then in the middle of the night, go wheat paste them up onto the wall. So instead of spray painting on the wall, she was gluing prints to the walls. And it was just a real remarkable thing. And so we, two or three years ago, we got a piece of hers into the collection. And and she's still one of the younger artists out there going real strong. So it's not the old classics too, but, but you know, new things. It's exciting. No, I know I promised you that we were only going to talk for an hour. And we're, I was worried I was going to make it. We're well <laughs> over that at this point. It's, uh, yeah, it's it happens with all of ours. I, I'm starting to think that maybe an hour isn't even enough time. But um, especially later on, you know, if you want to talk about your um, that list that you mentioned, um, if, you know, you have a specific set of new exhibits that are going on that you really want to come on and talk about, just shoot us an email. We would love to to have you on and talk a little bit more about what you've got on offer there at the museum. Okay. But um, yeah, I think we're going to maybe try to wrap it up here um, so that we're not all uh, tired. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but for me, I haven't, I barely touched all of this one. My throat is on fire. <laughs> That's okay. I'm the new, I'm the new talker now please, please take over for me people are talking <laughs> i'm the new or i the term i guess i mean it's not a new term but i see it on social media a lot now is yap like <laughs> y-a-p you know i'm just a yapper is what i've been seeing people say so i guess that's my new role on this podcast <laughs> and and uh, we appreciate that yes <laughs> uh, at this okay, point i usually turn it over to joe and ask uh what do we got for community events coming up joe Okay, uh, the first thing I want to mention is not so much an event as a uh, service or product uh, that I just want to make sure that I mention. Uh, we just had the grand opening back in uh, January, but I want to make sure that everybody knows about the Mustang Studio, which is an audio recording studio that is housed here at Moffat Library in our lobby. Um, and... Uh, it's available for any current faculty, staff, or student, and there's information about how to reserve that room uh, on our website. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Forever Mac, which is a tribute to the Fleetwood Mac, uh, is going to be at the Iron Horse Pub on March 16th, uh, Wednesday, March 20th, in the Kiowa Room in the Clark Student Center, the Red River Reading Series, is going to have uh, creative readings done by the Director of Clinical Teaching and Innovation and a couple of students. Uh, the Wichita Theater is currently producing Mary Poppins and they still have showings of that uh, through March 23rd. Uh, on campus, the Department of Music will have a Woodwind Studio Recital in Aiken Auditorium on March 21st. Uh, also on March 21st, the WFMA uh, is offering a mixed media collage workshop. Uh, Stage two dinner theater is having performances of Ken Ludwig's Baskerville, which is a Sherlock Holmes mystery on March 22nd and 23rd and April 5th and 6th. Uh, Zach Williams and Riley Clemens are taking the stage on their uh, 100 Highways tour coming to K. Yeager Coliseum on March 23rd. And uh, the Department of Music will present a percussion ensemble concert, also in Aiken Auditorium, uh, on April 9th. Uh, and if you want to know more about those things or anything going on uh, in our community or on campus, uh, check out the events section on the MSU Texas uh, homepage, or go to the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And just for fun, when you go to any of these events or purchase tickets for them, tell them you heard about it on Club Moffat Talks. Um, before we sign off, there's something I can't believe I forgot. I just remembered this, um, and it's completely a, a personal thing. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think anyone else here would be personally affected by it, but um, at the beginning of this month in March, um, World famous Japanese artist, manga author, uh, Akira Toriyama passed away. The news just came out a few days ago. Um, 
Dragon Ball, it, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball, that whole series is one of the most important pieces of fiction in my life. I mean, even up here on my desk, I've got a little Goku that I keep up here just so I can, you know, he's over here above my head, giving me strength. Um, I I dearly, dearly love Akira Toriyama and all his work. Uh, he worked on Dragon Quest, and he's got his own, like, he's got other stuff that he's worked on besides Dragon Ball, but that's the one that just means so much to me, and I just wanted to, you know, give a brief tribute for what it's worth. Um, I, it, I still don't believe it's real, and um, I made a noise that, when I read it, that my wife thought something horrible had just happened to my uh three-month-old daughter um i yeah i ch can just say rest in peace you've given us a lot of um really uh inspirational works to look at i remember one thing that i mentioned is uh in the opening lyrics to the dragon ball z theme song the the author the singer says uh like one of the lyrics is something like um I'd rather I'd rather my head be empty so I can stuff it full of dreams. I've always just thought that was such a uh, beloved way of saying I'd rather I'd rather be a dum dum if I could be optimistic and look toward the future and all this stuff. And um, that's just that's just what that's what Dragon Ball means to me. And uh, I'm deeply deeply upset about a uh, almost passing enough that I want to mention it on the uh, podcast even though it has nothing to do with our podcast. So uh, that's I all. mean, it does art. What's that? He connects He connects to this through art. We're talking about art today, and he's an amazing, amazing artist and yeah. person. So not only that, he's connected tons and tons and countless people with just just like one thing, like Dragon Ball Z is huge. Like they, they were, I remember seeing a thing where they were showing it on a projector in like Mexico City or something when, when an episode mm -hmm. came out of the newer series. And just because like so just people just find it so beloved and yeah I, i'm just i'm having a hard time with it so i just wanted to talk about it here um but um other than that just to just to kind of sign off here um danny if you wouldn't mind uh just sending us that collection you've got the the digital library collection that you mentioned with uh, all of your prints from the museum of art i'll see if we have a, a link to that in our databases and if we don't i'll see if we can uh what we can do about putting that on our list as well okay but uh anyone else have anything before we sign off here no okay all right uh from all of us here at club moffitt um thank you so much for listening to our podcast and we will see you again on the next one bye-bye